All right, well, thank you for seeing, seeing us today. And, and as you know, we want to talk really about the ideas of anarchism and your thoughts on anarchism. And um, I, it's going to be a rather wandery chat, okay. but hopefully we'll, we'll get somewhere. Yeah, <coughs> um, never know. All right. <laughs> in, in, I think in, in the middle 90s, you, in an interview that you gave, you talked about one of the problems with anarchism was that maybe it was too negative. It criticised but didn't offer a positive. Well, I don't. If I said that, I shouldn't have, because oh, right. I don't agree with it. Right. In fact, uh, you can take a look at the shelf up there. Yes, I was, I was, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are uh, anarchist studies which offer proposals for society in such meticulous detail yes. that they go beyond anything yeah. plausible, in my view. Like Abad de Santillan is a famous case. Yes, of, uh, yes. Who, in 1936, I guess, uh, wrote a critique of the anarchist revolution in Spain, and uh, it was an Argentine anarchist uh, who was in Spain, and uh, he uh, was called After the Revolution or something like that, and he uh, laid out a very detailed program for what a uh, largely anarcho-syndicalist uh, uh, vision of Spanish society, or for that matter any society, ought to be like. And there are many other proposals. I mean, the question, I think the question about detailed planning for the future is not so much uh, can we do it, sure we can do it in lots of different ways, uh, but whether we know enough about uh, human beings, about society, about uh, institutions, uh, the effects of, of introducing institutional structures into human life. Do we know enough about that to be able to plan in any detail what a society should look like, or should it be uh, an experimental, uh, sure. guided by certain general ideas about uh, liberty and equality and authority and domination, and uh, just uh, have pe pe let people explore different ways of uh, working through this maze and see what comes natural to them, uh, how much variety there should be, uh, you know, what are you going to do with uh, people who don't want to work or uh, people with criminal tendencies or uh, people who don't want to go to meetings and uh, you know there's millions of questions that come up that, to what extent do you want to interchange jobs or delegate responsibility on the basis of interest and talent and so on I mean uh, if somebody wants to be a carpenter or a nuclear physicist or a pianist and somebody else wants to be uh, an administrator do you necessarily require that they interchange jobs as a matter of principle, even if they're all happier if they don't? I don't think we know. There's both positive and negative yeah. comments you can make about that, but I don't think we know the answers. I, I was but reading um, Isaac Puente, the, the Spanish libertarian communist theorist, who, who was arguing rather like that, and he was arguing that, well, you know, if one becomes a, <coughs> a teacher, one learns by experience. And if one becomes a doctor, one learns by experience. Wasn't one isn't a doctor when one's 22? You you learn, and maybe that's how anarchism ought to be seen. Well, what we at a very general level, I think mm. we would all agree that people in the rough range of those who call themselves anarchists, uh, there would be at least a general agreement that whatever social structures and arrangements are developed, uh, they ought to. Uh, maximize the possibilities for people to pursue their own creative potential. Sure. And you can't make a formula for them. No. People are too different and they ought to be different and the differences ought to be encouraged. Yeah. Uh, and it's just like with raising children, you, know, you want them to find their <laughs> yes, own path. Yes, you don't yes. say, here's the rigid framework. I, I'm saying sometimes people do, but shouldn't say, here's the framework you're supposed to follow. Uh, and uh, my own view, I differ from some of my close friends on this, is that uh, we should be cautious about trying to sketch out the nature of a future society in too much detail. Uh, it's not that it can't be done. It can be done. It can be done in interesting ways, uh, different ways, and has been done. Uh, but I think the real question is to what extent is it important to do it, and to what extent is it important to just try an experiment and uh, chip away at existing structures and so on. Actually, another problem, which I think 
must be faced is that uh, at, at any particular point in human history, people have not understood what is oppression. Mm -hmm. It's something you learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if I go back to my, say, parents and grand, say my grandmother, uh, she didn't think she was oppressed by being in a super patriarchal family uh, where the the father would uh, walk down the street and not recognize his daughter when she came because you're not supposed to, not because you didn't know who she was, because you don't nod to your daughter. Yeah. So it didn't feel like oppression, but it just felt like the way life works. I mean, what psychic effects it had internally, you know, that's a complicated question. But uh, as anyone involved in any kind of activism knows, say the women's movement, I mean, one of the first tasks is to get people to understand that they're living under conditions of oppression and domination. Mm -hmm. It isn't obvious. No. And who knows what forms of oppression and domination we're just accepting yes. without even noticing them. And at some further stage of uh, self-enlightenment and communal understanding, we'll realize we have to deal with. Uh, and we can't plan for them if we don't know about them. Linked to that, then, does Emma Goldman, <coughs> as she grew older, <coughs> and feared for the fact that there may not be an immediate revolution, w became very influenced by, I think, Gustav Landauer, who talked about that the state isn't just out there, it's inside us, that we have to become ourselves as free as we can be um, in, in capitalism, that in fact that the, she was always worried that there may be a chance that people won't be ready for revolution, and that there is a way of developing the politics of the personal so maybe more people could be ready to experience that life that's possible that's quite true I mean people uh, in fact there are you know the people who understand this the best are those who are carrying out the control and domination mm -hmm. I mean, in the more free societies like the United States and England where popular struggles have won a lot of freedom over the years mm -hmm. and the state has limited capacity to coerce. It's very striking that it's precisely in those societies that elite groups, the business world, uh, state managers and so on, recognized early on that they're going to have to develop massive uh, methods of uh, control of attitude and opinion because you can't control people by force anymore. Uh, and therefore you have to modify their consciousness so they don't perceive uh, that they are living under conditions of alienation, oppression, subordination, and so on. In fact, uh, that's what, I mean, you know, probably a couple of trillion dollars a year spent on this in the United States, very self-consciously. I mean, from uh, uh, the framing of television advertisements for two-year-olds uh, to, the, to what you taught in graduate school economics programs. Uh, it's uh, designed to create a, a kind of a consciousness of subordination. And also, of, uh, it's also intended specifically and pretty consciously to suppress normal human emotions. So normal human emotions are sympathy and solidarity. I mean, oh. not just for people, I mean, for yeah. doll stranded dolphins, you know. Yeah. It's, a, it's just a normal reaction of people. And if you go back to, say, the classical political economists, people like Adam Smith, now this was, that's taken for granted, it was the core of human nature. Any mm -hmm. society's got to deal yes. with this. Well, you know, one of the main uh, uh, concentrations of uh, advertising and education is to drive that out of your mind. Uh, and it's very conscious. In fact, it's conscious in social policy right in front of our eyes today. Um, so it says they take uh, the effort to destroy Social Security. Well, what's the point of that? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the point, of, I mean, there's no, I mean, there's a lot of scam about financial problems and this and that, which is all total nonsense. Uh, but the, and of course, they want, you know, they'd like Wall Street to make a killing. But underlying it all, I think, is something much deeper. Social Security is based on a, human emotion, a natural human emotion which has to be driven out of people's minds, mm -hmm. namely the emotion that you care about other people. You care. It's a social response, a community responsibility 
to care whether a disabled widow across town has enough food to eat or whether a kid across the street can you know, go to school or something. And you have to get that out of people's heads. Uh, you have to make them say, look, you're a personal, rational wealth maximizer. If that disabled widow didn't prepare for her own future, it's her problem, it's not your yeah. problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's not your fault that she doesn't have enough to eat, so why should you care? There is no such thing as society, as Margaret said. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's only you maximizing your own wealth and subordinating yourself to power and not thinking about anyone else. Mm -hmm. And that has an effect. You can see it in attitudes. Now, just get back to your point. Same is true of those who are trying to change society to more decent forms. Yes, you're going to have to deal with people's consciousness and awareness. And as I say, every organizer knows it. I mean, take mm. the women's movement as a striking example. It begins with consciousness raising groups mm. where people talk to each other and uh, bring out uh, elements of their lives that they may not perceive mm. very clearly. Mm. And it's true across the board, mm. in educational mm. institutions and in factories, everywhere else. And it's very striking to see how these uh, this has worked over the years. I mean, if you go back to uh, the early days of the Industrial Revolution, Say like right around here, you know, Lowell and Lawrence, the places where the textile mills were being created and so on. Uh, among the people who were drawn into the early factories, young women from the farms, you know, Irish artisans from the slums and so on, there was an extremely radical consciousness. Yeah. Uh, it was just natural. They didn't learn and read Marx or anything like this. Yes. or anything else. It's just the natural assumption. It's in their, they had a very free press, something that's been lost. But the free press of those days expressed, uh, just took for granted that wage labor is pretty much like slavery. And that those who uh, work in the mills are on them, obviously. Why do uh, and that they are, and that the whole factory system, industrial system, is just crushing our cultural values and creative impulses and turning us into robots and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. All of this was understood, taken for granted. You go out to a, a working class neighborhood today, you won't find it. And that has no. to be, it's not that they, people have to be taught it, it has to be brought out from their inner yes. nature yes. where it's been suppressed by very conscious efforts. Actually, you know, it, it, it's striking to see how conscious this is. So, you know, about like a century ago, uh, Taylorism was introduced into industry. Uh, Taylorism, Fred, Frederick Taylor was... Yes. The that. <coughs> so the idea was to, basically the idea is to turn workers into robots. So every motion is controlled and yes. they don't have any choices and uh, they become essentially robots. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, like everything else, it was initiated in, uh, in the military system because there you can carry out experiments cost-free mm -hmm. and you know, public and cost and take risk-taking and so on. But then it was trans transferred to industry, you know, it's the mass production system and so on. And it did, uh, Lenin was very enamored of it. Mm -hmm. it yes, was yes. terrific, you know, because yeah. it basically had the same conceptions as capitalist managers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the idea was to robotize work. Yes. But it was very quickly recognized uh, that, uh, like the 1920s, uh, that uh, uh, what they called on-job control, you know, turning a person into a robot on the job, can be extended to off-job control. Mm -hmm. That is controlling every other aspect of life the same way. So why should people not be robots in their entire life? And to be a robot means to focus on what were called the superficial things of life, like fashionable consumption, not on care for one another, mm. not on working together to you know, create a decent environment, not mm. for, you know, what will the world be like for your children. Just turn, turn you into a passive consumer, an obedient uh, a person who pushes buttons every couple of years and is taught that's democracy, uh, follows orders, don't think, mm. uh, and uh, I identify your own value as a human being in the amount of uh, useless uh, consumption that yes. you can carry out. Uh, and uh, that's off-job control. And, sure. it, uh, and it runs from all, through all the institutions. And it's a huge industry. Yes. 
And yes, uh, to overcome off-job control and make people realize that you know your value as a human being isn't how deep you can go in debt and how many credit cards you can max out to get commodities you don't want. That's not your value as a human being. Uh, it's something else. I mean, when you go to a you know you go to a mall and uh, over the weekend and you see young kids who are in their spare time, young girls usually. Their spare time was fun, you know, is window shopping. Yeah, yes. I mean, that's, you know, if yes. they want to do it, you can't say they don't do it. But what this tells you about how people's consciousness has been modified by off-job control is pretty frightening. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, uh, linked to that as well, um, one of the things that I think is striking when you look at the history of anarchism is that it's at its most popular it was almost an organic movement and answering community needs. The Jewish anarchists in New York in the 1890s, in Spain obviously, but Argentina, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. France. Isn't community also being destroyed by things such as technology, where now there are more communities in cyberspace than maybe the type of community that you or I may have grown up, myself, I'm, you know, just a coal mining community yeah. where you knew everyone yeah. and everyone knew you, and yes, there were tensions, but you had that sense of relationships. Isn't that really going very quickly, and isn't technology helping that go? Well, in my view, technology is a pretty neutral instrument. Right. It could go in that direction, it could go in opposite directions. Right. I mean, uh, technology could, in fact, be used to... Uh, uh, let the uh, workforce in a factory run it without any managers sure. by providing people at the workbench with real-time information that would enable them to join with others in making mm -hmm. sensible decisions. That's yeah. another use of technology. Sure, of course, absolutely. that technology doesn't get developed. <laughs> uh, and in fact, that there are very interesting studies of how it does work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, studies was done by some of the best was done by David Noble, who used to be here and a little too radical. He yeah. doesn't mean here anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but he did some terrific work on uh, um, a lot of things. But the main one, the main one of the main topics he studied was what's called numerical processing. That is, computer-controlled machine tool production, that kind of thing. Uh, and that was like everything else developed in the military system, where you can do it at public cost. Right. Uh, but uh, it, it was designed. Uh, there were a lot of different ways of designing it. He points out. So one way of designing it would have been to uh, pr uh, eliminate managerial levels and put decision making into the hands of skilled mechanics, uh, mm -hmm. who would who sort of knew what they're doing. They're usually the people who know more anyway than the guys in the offices upstairs. Yeah. And uh, uh, I'm sure it was true in the coal mine. Yeah, 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 guys yeah, yeah, yeah. The coal mine work, the guys down yeah, there, yeah, not the one that's sitting yeah, in an office yeah. in New York somewhere. But uh, So put the decision-making into their hands, and the technology could have been designed for that. And studies were done showing that would even increase profits. But it was done the opposite way. It was done in such a way as to increase levels of management control, which is highly inefficient, to de-skill mechanics. Uh, and to uh, turn them into uh, robots who yeah. would just push the buttons. Yes. Well, that's a choice as to how to use technology. And it's a kind of class warfare. Mm -hmm. uh, but it has nothing to do with the inherent nature of technology. And I think the same is true here. Right. However, the, the interesting one, and I don't, you know, I don't know what's going to come of it, but it is true that there are virtual communities yes. which are very real. I mean, yes. I would say that 95% of my close friends I've never seen. Yes. We just uh, interact all the time on the internet. And, you know, my age, I figure it's perfectly reasonable. <laughs> but when I see my grandchildren do it, yes. I don't like it much. I mean, I think they have to learn yes. things about face to face communication. Well, just going, yes, because, I mean, my, my son does instant messaging. And he instant messages with people whom, when he's at school, he can hardly talk to. Yeah. But on, it, it provides a neutral framework, but I worry enormously because I'd rather he spoke and interacted. I, I agree with you. I don't know what <coughs> kind of effect this is going to have on young kids growing up. Right. I mean, they live in an imaginary world. Yeah. And uh, even interacting with people who are adopting false personalities 
uh, and uh, you know, when kids yeah, used to yeah, play Dungeons yeah. and Dragons, well, okay, yeah, I wasn't, yeah. in that. I didn't love it, but I didn't see anything much wrong with it. On the other hand, when you're living, when a lot of your life is in an imaginary world with uh, characters who you have created and have created themselves, and you don't have face-to-face -face human interactions with. Now that can have psychic effects, which I don't think we understand, yeah, but okay. could be pretty malevolent. Taking that a step forward, you, you know that there is a tendency, certainly uh, in the last ten years in anarchism, we, we call it primitivism, anarcho primitivism, who, who suggests that capitalism is so rotten, the, technolo the technology involved in capitalism is so rotten, that we just ought to just get rid of the whole thing. It's so destructive, so corroding, so so horrible that it's just damaging people let's just get rid of it and, and step you know to back or, or forward if in their eyes to a, a more natural organic world at one with nature is, is that possible uh, I mean you know I sympathize with the people who say that but I don't think they are realizing that what they're calling for is mass genocide of billions of people uh, because the way society is now structured and organized, you know, urban life and so on and so forth. If you eliminate these structures, everybody dies. For example, I can't grow my own food. Mm. Uh, it's a you know, nice idea, yeah, but yeah. it's not going to work. You know, yeah. Not in this world. Uh, and in fact, uh, none of us want to live a hunter-gatherer life. Uh, it's, there are just too many things in life that the modern world offers us. Uh, but just on, in plain terms of survival, that's calling for the worst mass genocide in human history. Yes. Uh, and unless one thinks through these things, yes. it's not really serious. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, a couple of quick things now. <coughs> a lot of people are not into Daniel Garan's book, Anarchism. Mm -hmm. And um, we. A slight while ago, AK Press put out his No Goes No Masters in English. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great book. It's obvious that for Garan, he, he was very keen to blend what I think he felt were the best, best aspects of anarchism and the best aspects of, uh, of socialism in, into this libertarian, communist, it's libertarian socialism. Libertarian socialism yeah. is what he called it. Do, do, you, do you think that those two terms, libertarian socialism and anarchism, are synonymous, or do you think there are real differences? I don't think you can really say because the terms of political discourse aren't well defined. Sure. I mean, capitalism, trade, you know, state, uh, any, pick any one, you know, they're pretty loose terms, which is okay. It doesn't make sense to try to define terms carefully when you don't have any explanatory theory to embed them in. Uh, but the fact is that we can't really answer the question. Anarchism covers too many things. Uh, libertarian socialism covers too many things, but I think the, I think I mean I, I sympathize with what he's trying to do. I think it's the right thing. I mean I think if you look carefully, there are really close uh, similarities and relationships among the the anti-state, the uh, more anti-statist, anti-vanguardist uh, left elements of social of, so of the socialist movement, the Marxist movement, in fact. Take people like Anton Panikok and yes. others. Uh, there's cl close similarities between them and um, some of the wings of the anarchist movement, like the anarcho syndicalists. In fact, it's pretty hard to make much of a distinction between, uh, say, Panikok's uh, workers' councils and um, you know, anarcho syndicalist mm -hmm. conceptions of how to organize society. There are some differences, but uh, you know, there are the kind of differences that ought to exist among people who are working together in a comradely relationship. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, that's a sensible blend, sure. in my view. And, and I mean, the much sharper distinction is between all of these movements and uh, the various forms of totalitarianism, like yes. Bolshevism yes. or yes. corporate capitalism yes. and so on. Yes. I mean, one, there you have a real break. Yes. Yes. Totalitarian structures on the one hand, free free societies and the other. In fact, I think there are similarities between, uh, significant ones, between libertarian socialism and anarchism, this blend, and even very mainstream thinkers like John Dewey. Yeah, yes. There are striking similarities. Well, I know he was 
quite influenced by Stelton, the modern school, mm. and he took a lot of those ideas and mm. thought about mm. the visitors. Yeah. Yeah. The basic yeah. view was that uh, unless we eliminate what he called industrial feudalism and turn it into industrial democracy, which is, mm. means pretty much workers' yeah. control, uh, then the whole formal democratic system doesn't really mean very much. Mm -hmm. And he comes straight out of the mainstream yeah. of American yeah. history, as yeah. American as apple pie. Yeah, a couple of quick things. I, I, I know from from reading you, you, you're very much impressed. I think you will be good by people like Panikuk and go to that left communist strand. I take it you don't see a danger of things like workers' councils or, or the, the work of Panikuk or go to lead into another form of totalitarianism. You think that breaks from that? No, I think there's plenty of danger. Right, but the same. There's also danger that. Uh, you know, participatory, participatory economics could lead to totalitarianism. Yes. I mean, every one of us has been in hack movement meetings. And we all know the dynamics. If you're in a, whatever you're working on, you mm. know, um, yeah. putting a traffic light on the corner or organizing resistance against the Vietnam War, whatever, whatever it may be, there's a meeting of people. And there are, you know, there's, uh, we, we differ in our levels of tolerance for boring activities. I mean, some people just drop off pretty fast, like me, for example. I just can't tolerate that much of it. Uh, other people are really committed to uh, you know, basically controlling it. And there is a natural dynamic in which the most free, cooperative, libertarian structure can turn into an authoritarian one, uh, just by virtue of who's going to stick around and you know take enough control and finally make the decision and everybody wants to and so on and so forth. Yes. Those are always dangerous. The last and person standing. Is yeah. And you'll exactly. never overcome them. We're all perfectly yes. familiar with it from yes. you know, groups of friends, affinity groups working yes. on something or other. Yes. So yes. yes, those are always problems to deal with and you can't, uh, I mean, there's no magic formula for preventing that from happening. Okay, and linked to that, I guess, is, is what you feel about the role of class and change in anarchism. It's, it's no doubt that certainly I think in, in America there is a tendency in anarchism, in, in new anarchist thought, to see classes belonging to the past. It, it, it really isn't the most relevant foci, loci of change anymore. Yeah, how many um, of those people have worked in your coal mining community, let's say, or on a factory floor, or as a data processor in, the, you know, in industry? I mean, if, you, if those are your jobs, you don't have any problem with class. Right. You mm -hmm. know who gives the bosses and who, takes them, who gives the orders and who takes them. Uh, and you know why. Uh, the capital, you understand the capital concentration that lies behind the choice of those who give the orders and those who take the orders. Now those are class differences. Uh, often some other domain you can say, I don't see them, but uh, enter into the real life of people who live and work in society and I don't think they have much problem discerning class differences and their significance. There's a huge difference between giving orders and taking. Yeah. Yes, and even if it's true that the people who are giving orders are taking them from somewhere else, but that's the nature of totalitarian systems. I mean, the, you know, it's, it's not the top guy gives the orders to the bottom guy. There's levels of transmission through which orders are taken and given, managerial supervision and uh, decision making of various kinds, and that creates a whole variety of class, cl fundamental class differences. And there are plenty of people who just take the orders. Mm -hmm. Or else, or else mm -hmm. starve. Yeah. Choice. Sure, sure. And in fact, we see uh, class issues arising all the time. I mean, take say real concrete issues. Like one of the very concrete issues right now is what's called outsourcing. Mm -hmm. What attitude should people take toward outsourcing? And they're conflicting values. I mean, first of all, outsourcing is a very misleading term. Outsourcing is internal to totalitarian institutions. I mean, if GM outsources, that means uh, they are transferring jobs to some to, an, uh, to a, uh, a company, a firm under their control, uh, which is able to escape 
labor laws, environmental constraints, and so on, and to give them cheap inputs for the next stage of manufacturing. But that's all internal to command economies. So outsourcing is you know, it's kind of like a pretense that's something to do with the free market or nothing. Internal workings of command economies. All right, should, what should our attitude be towards it? I mean, if people here are losing their jobs uh, because you can get uh, a worker at uh, you know 10% of the cost in, say, India or China, should we be for it or against it? Well, you know, there's arguments both ways. And I think all the arguments are highly misleading because they're accepting a framework that we shouldn't accept. Mm. I mean, if you accept the framework that says totalitarian command economies have the right to make these decisions, uh, and uh, the, dip, the wage levels and working conditions are fixed facts, uh, and then we have to make choices within those assumptions. Well, you know, then you can make an argument that uh, poor people here ought to lose their jobs to even poorer people somewhere else, uh, because that increases, you know, economic pie and you go through the usual story. But why take those assumptions? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, there's there's other ways of dealing with the problem. For example, rich people here. Uh, like people like me, for example, you know, who are on the top few percent of the income ladder, uh, we could cut back our luxurious lifestyles, uh, pay proper taxes, uh, all sorts of things. And I'm not even talking about Bill Gates. I mean, just you know, people who are reasonably privileged. Uh, instead of imposing the burden on the poor here uh, and say, well, you poor people have to give up your jobs because even poorer people need them over there. We can say, okay, we rich people uh, will give up some small part of our ludicrous luxury uh, and, you, and it, uh, use it to raise living standards and working conditions elsewhere and to let them have enough capital to develop their own you know, um, economy by their own means, and then the issue won't arise. But it's much more convenient to say poor people here ought to pay the burden uh, under the framework of command economy totalitarianism. That's the easy way. Mm. Uh, but, you know, if you think it through, it's certainly not the only way. No, it's not. No. And it, every, almost every social issue you think about, a uh, real one, live one, you know, the ones are right on the table, sure. uh, has these properties. Right. Uh, we, we don't have to accept and shouldn't accept the, the, the framework of domination of thought and attitude that allows only certain choices to be made. And those choices almost invariably come down to how to put the burden on the poor. Yes. That's class warfare. Yes. You, know, you don't want to call it class, don't use the word, but it's class yes. warfare, yes. even by real nice people like sure. us who think that it's good to help poor workers in yeah. China. Yeah. Within a framework of class warfare, which preserves our own privilege and transfers the cost to the poor here. Yeah. And yeah, that's, these are Critical. Again, it's matters of raising consciousness among very decent people, you know, yeah. our friends. Aye. Here's, a, here's a, a, a more grim question, I guess. Uh, Voltaire Clare, um, in the 1900s, in an essay, talks about the, the hope she has of, of a peaceful change into a better world and, and talks about then the, the masters who are creating such a system that they're going to reap a horrible whirlwind. Now, are we still in a situation where a peaceful transition to a, a freer, better world is possible for us? Or, or is, uh, can we not say, or, or is it unlikely as the years go on? Mm. Actually, nobody knows. Right. But uh, my own subjective judgment, you know, low credibility subjective judgment, is that the uh, opportunities for peaceful change are considerably greater now than they have been in the past. Mm. And the reason for that is that uh, the repressive uh, apparatus of state and corporate power has been reduced. Uh, you can't break up strikes with Pinkerton guards anymore. Mm. They won't get away with it. Uh, you can't... Uh, uh, send out the, uh, you know, smash up uh, uh, working class uh, self-run towns like Homestead, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, and the National Guard. You can't get away with that anymore. No. 
Uh, well, all that makes a difference. I mean, yeah, enough yeah. victories have been won yes. so that repression has reduced. I mean, just take a look at the just simple question of how many workers get killed in labor action. Well, you know, it used to be very high. Oh, yes. And it went up to the late 1930s. Yes. Uh, that, I mean, I can remember it as a kid, you know, workers getting killed in labor actions by security guards, you know, Pinkerton, uh, police, and the rest of it. Uh, that has stopped. Yes. Uh, I mean, maybe occasionally it will happen, but, you know, it, it's a substantial change. Certainly, I mean, it, in, when we look at the Emma Goldman papers, that, yeah. you know, we look at the New York Times or we get students to look at the daily papers of the 1890s. I think every week, yeah, well, there's an unnamed worker, worker just just killed. Up killed. I, mean, I, I saw it as a kid, yeah. you know, in my childhood memories of uh, watching police wade into groups yeah. of women strikers yeah. outside a textile plant and just beating the shit out of them, right. you know. Well, you know, I don't think you get away with no. that now. No. All right, uh, and that generalizes. Uh, just like you know, it would be much harder now for the U.S. to institute a military coup in, say, Brazil yeah. than it was 40 years ago. Yeah. Much harder. In fact, probably impossible. Uh, because there are just enough changes so that people won't accept it anymore. And the structures of power have dissolved. Right. You know. By now, in fact, a lot of the structures of power are very fragile. Uh, a lot of them have shifted from direct coercion to indoctrination and uh, thought and attitude control. Well, you know, it's bad enough. You know, yeah. It's bad enough to have your kids bombarded with horrendous television. But it's a lot different than having them beaten over the head by oh, yes. Okay. yes, and uh, yes. having torture chambers around and yes. so on. So uh, those changes mean that there are many more options for peaceful change. But it does make it more complex to fight right. back. Yeah, it makes it very complex because yeah. you have to fight out of... At least if there's a Pinkerton guard, you know who your, you enemy, know who your enemy is. You know who your enemy is. And when it's uh, your friendly executive and the yeah. soulful corporation yeah. who's really on the same side that you are and yeah. so on and so forth, yeah, then it's harder. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean it's impossible. No, no. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I happened to be giving a... I hope I'm not giving personal <laughs> things away, but I have to give a talk, which I do every year, to a terrific group of uh, uh, young, mostly young labor uh, activists in a group at Harvard, which is run by a fantastic person, Elaine Bernard, who's you know, a real dynamic, live wow. wire, you know, labor activist, wow. feminist, terrific. Uh, this program for the bringing the labor, young labor leaders into Harvard, was uh, begun, I guess, around 1940, uh, as part of the corporate academic reaction to this perceived threat, real threat, of significant radical labor action that might just revolutionize the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, a sit-down strike yeah. is like one thought away from taking over the plant. Uh, and it was really close, and it was understood. Well, part of the technique of undercutting that, as it was becoming harder to use Pinkerton guards and police and so on to smash this up, uh, it became understood that what you have to do is socialize the uh, rising young labor leadership, civilize them, yeah. teach them how to bring them to Harvard yeah. and do what Harvard's good at. In fact, what it does with its own students, teach them how to have polite conversations and class solidarity, you know, solidarity, and uh, uh, drink the right wine, and just, you know, pick up the right attitudes and relations, and so on. So this is stick these young guys in the business school, and they'll see we're all friends, and we're all doing the same thing, and so on and so forth. And it went on like that for years, until Elaine Bernard took it over about ten and years ago. Subvert. Almost in instantly, it's become a center for young, radical, international labor activism. Yeah. And the reason is all these ideas are just barely below the surface. You know. I just puncture the surface slightly, and it all comes out. Yeah. Uh, because it's also natural and obvious. It takes massive effort to beat it down. But And by now, it's completely different. Yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, and, and has big effects all throughout the world because it's going to come from everywhere. Well, that can be done in all kinds of places, but those are modes of peaceful change. Uh -huh. uh, and they've, um, just in our own lifetimes, they've led to very big changes. Uh, and uh, in the past, even more. You know, something uh -huh. like 
I mean, the changes go in both directions. Mm. So on the one hand, you can't crush homestead the way you could 100 years ago. Mm. On the other hand, uh, the consciousness that led to homestead is gone. Mm. So it's not just oh. progress, but re rebuilding that consciousness is a lot is is the kind of peaceful activity that can be carried out yeah. and is in many respects a lot easier than fighting the National Guard. Yes, yes. A final question because I think we're running out of time. Um, I've just been working on Berkman's book now and then and just AK Press have just republished it, What is Anarchism? Reading his letters in the 20s when he's, he's working on the book and he's finding it very difficult, one of the things that he's trying to come to grips with, I think, in the book, is, well, why haven't people come to this idea? This idea, which to me is just common sense, it's, it's just a, what we were saying earlier, this natural instinct almost to solidarity and support. And I've seen Russia, I've seen totalitarianism in action. Why haven't anarchist ideas had a greater impact in the world? I think he's talking about. Now, that's... 80 years ago nearly and, and, and the question we're also facing is people uh, uh, at least believe what is it Emma Goldman says anarchism is the only belief that shows man, men and women their true self who they can be we, we see that we know that instinctively yet it still had such a minuscule impact is that true or is it I don't think it's true that it's had right. a minuscule impact right. I mean a lot of the progressive social change of uh, the past century uh, you know isn't anarchist like right. a progressive taxation is an anarchist social security is an anarchist but it's a reflection of attitudes and understanding which if they go a little bit further do reflect anarchist commitment and they do they are based on the idea that uh, there really should be solidarity sympathy community mutual support mutual aid and so on and so forth and uh, opportunities for creative action, and they're all based on these. They don't, you know, they're subdued and channeled and modified, so they don't take real libertarian forms. But they're there, and they lead to social change. Uh, why hasn't it gone further? Well, a large part of it is violence. Uh, so take, say, Bergman's uh, experience in Russia. You know, he, he entered into a violent totalitarian state. Mm. I mean, up until the uh, Bolshevik takeover, the coup, revolution, whatever you want to call it. Uh, up until that, uh, there were uh, very significant uh, popular uh, libertarian, sometimes anarchist initiatives all over, uh, running from you know, peasant anarchism in the Ukraine to uh, uh, workers' councils, the Soviets, and so on and so forth. Well, they were simply smashed by force. Yeah. Uh, by great violence. I mean, Lenin and Trotsky were totalitarian extremists. Yes. And they had a theory behind it. Um, they were kind of dedicated Marxists who believed that uh, backward, primitive country like Russia can't go to socialism. The master's principles tell us that. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, we have to drive it, drive the country by force uh, through the stages of essentially state capitalist development and then ultimately something will happen I mean they weren't repeating the master accurately this required suppression of many years of Marx's later work which were literally suppressed yeah. when he was yeah. studying the peasant societies in Russia and sure. so on and so forth but that doesn't really matter I mean the point is they had a conception they used it they had the force it, was a, it wasn't easy like you know to destroy uh, Machno's movement or crunched out or to eliminate the Soviets and so on it wasn't a trivial operation, but it was carried out. And Berkman saw it and he saw a totalitarian, vicious totalitarian society arising in very much the way anarchists had predicted. Yes. I mean Bakunin yes. spelled it all out. Yes. In fact even Trotsky in his yes. early yes. work before he joined it said what was going to happen, as did Rosa Luxemburg and others. Uh, but it happened. So th and that's their variant. Our variant was different. Uh, Wilson uh, Berkman was writing right after Wilson's Red Scare, uh, which uh, made the Patriot Act look like a Tea Party, and uh, was a violent repression run by the progressives, Woodrow Wilson and others, and not just affecting 
you know, anarchist, not just Emma Goldman who was kicked out, but you know, even people pretty much in the mainstream, yes. like Eugene Debs, yeah. you know, yeah. leading labor yeah. figure. Yeah. He, I mean, Wilson was completely yeah. vindictive. You know, tossed him to the jail because he uh, raised some questions about the nobility of Wilson's war and uh, refused even to grant him an amnesty mm -hmm. when everyone else was granted an amnesty. This was real vindictive. And it, it really uh, crushed independent thought, crushed mm -hmm. labor, uh, had a big effect. Uh, so it was violence. Alongside the violence, there is uh, the rise of um, massive propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, that's to try to control attitudes and beliefs. Uh, but quite apart from that, there's something quite simple. I mean, there are disciplinary effects to the way life is organized. Uh, take, say, students today. Students today have many, f are, are more in some ways, I mean, in a lot of ways, they're freer than they were 60 years ago, their attitudes and commitments and so on. On the other hand, they're more disciplined. Yes. They're disciplined by yeah. debt. Yes, yes. And part of the reason yes. for arranging education so you come out with a heavy debt is so you're disciplined. Or um, let's take the last 20 years, the neoliberal years, roughly, uh, what's called globalization, but neoliberalism. Uh, a lot of it is, a, a very striking part of it is just aimed at discipline. Mm. Uh, it wants to eliminate freedom of choice and impose discipline. How do you do it? Yeah. Well, you know, you, if you have a couple in the United States now uh, working you know, each 50, each 50 hours a week to put food on the table, you don't have time to think about no. how to become a libertarian socialist. No. <laughs> what no. you're worried about it is, is how do I get food yeah. on the table? Where morning? can I shop no. cheaply? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I got a kid, a kids to take yeah. care of, and I got something to do with them. You know, when they're sick, I've got to go to work, and what's going to happen to them? Yeah. You know, uh, the and that's very uh, that's well designed techniques of imposing discipline, and there are costs to trying to be independent. I mean, just take say trying to organize a labor union. I mean, if you're the organizer, there's going to be a cost to you. I mean, maybe the workforce will gain, but there's a cost to you. Uh, we know there is. Uh, yes. We know what the cost is, not yes. just in energy and effort, but just in punishment. Yes. And the people who are living in fragile circumstances have, and they make a reasonable calculation. They say, well, I should take the cost. I have to get by. Uh, so there are many reasons why normal uh, instincts and attitudes don't come out. But, mm. you know, over time they often do. That's Absolutely. why we have social change yes. for the better. Okay. Hey, thank you for your time. It's really kind. Okay. It's really kind of you. Great to meet you as well. Thank you for your thoughts. Okay.